So I want to talk with you as a follow-up video to the video where I read the letter of Ignatius of Antioch. He's one of the three uh, most important uh, first church fathers that uh, you should read. Polycarp, Ignatius of Antioch, not Ignatius of Loyola, Ignatius of Antioch, and Clement of Rome. Those are the three who are the earliest of the church fathers, and uh, it would be good to, I mean, once you're familiar with the Bible, and very familiar with it, then go read these, and they will actually give you a good education on, on what the church looked like in the next generation after the apostles. So, if you have a question about it, I mean, because the New Testament was not written as a manual of how to do church. The book of Acts is not written as a manual of how to do church. It's written as a history of the establishing of the church. It, doesn't, it does describe in some places how the church functioned indirectly. And so we can kind of, you know, pick out a few things and, and learn a bit from it that way. Um, let me shut this down. I've got my email program open now. Still, go away. <clears throat> so, Paul's letters also are not written in order to be a manual for how to do church, although in Paul's epistles they're directed to churches in certain locations, but they're addressing specific problems they had at the time. And so, you know, it, again, it's not a manual for how to do church, but it is definitely speaking into very particular situations that they were facing. Uh, in addition, it does talk about the character that we should have as Christians in order to fellowship with one another. I apologize if you're hearing this heater. It's a water heater right here. And uh, that's how life is over here. Uh, so it's in the kitchen, at least in, in the last two apartments I've lived in. So uh, This microphone should mute it quite a bit. So that's why I'm using this microphone to kind of deaden those sounds. So. That's the thing to keep in mind when you're reading the scriptures, is that it's not a manual for how to do this and how to do that. Although you can learn some things from it about how to do this or how to do that, it's not a manual. You know, step by step, this is what we do, this is what we do, and that's complete, and that's all we do. So just because it's not mentioned in the New Testament doesn't mean it wasn't a practice of the church. So... Not everything that the church did as a practice was written in the New Testament. Just like not everything that Jesus did in his ministry was written in the New Testament. I read to you recently from the end of the Gospel of John. And it said that if all the things that the Lord did and said were written down, the books couldn't, the books, you know, there would be no room for the books in, in the whole universe, in the whole world. So, <clears throat> you have to remember that. Keep that in mind. That this is not a legal proof text, as the Protestants have converted it into. It's not. The Bible is not a legal proof text. It's not something to go and say, well, if it's in the Bible, then I'll believe it. And if it's not, I won't believe it. Really? So you don't believe your mother exists? Because she's not in the Bible. <laughs> You don't believe you're alive because you're not in the Bible. You know, I mean, that's absurd. I mean, you'd have to take it to that end if you're going to say that. That if it's not in the Bible, I'm not going to believe it. So cars aren't in the Bible, and yet you see them going down the road every day. You don't believe they exist? They exist. YouTube, that's not in the Bible. And here we are. <laughs> or right here on YouTube and you're listening. So that's an absurd thing to say. If it's not in the Bible, I won't believe it. There are plenty of things that are not in the Bible that were true or existed or were done. And even things that were not bad, even things that were good. It doesn't tell absolutely everything in the Bible. So... You've got to use the Bible for what it's meant to be, and that's a testimony. It's not a catalog. It's a testimony. 
It's God testifying to you of what is true. What he wants you to know that's true. And it's all about Jesus. We agree on that. <coughs> but you seem to forget it when you start trying to use it as a legal proof text. Because then you stop being about Jesus and you start being about the letter of the law. And you're the ones who say that we're saved by grace and not by law and all of this. And we don't have to obey the law and all of this. And yet you turn the Bible into a legal proof text. So now let's talk about how the Apocrypha was actually part of the Bible. <clears throat> it was included in the Septuagint. In those manuscripts, it's in there, it's considered canon. And some will say, oh, the Jews have never considered it canon. The Jews never had a canon. Not until after the Old Testament was written did they start to treat certain books as canon, except for the first five books of the Bible. That's always been canon. And then later, the prophets were treated as canon. That's why you have the, the term, the law and the prophets. And the other books were like fluid. You know, some of them weren't considered canon, and some were, but the Jews really didn't have this idea of canon, except for with the Torah. And they treated that like a legal document. But as far as everything else, <clears throat> everything else was more open-ended. And so you can't point to the Jews and say, well, the Jews never had a canon. Or, no, the Jews, uh, it wasn't in the Jewish canon. The Jews never had a canon until the middle, in between the Testaments, they started to formulate a canon, but it wasn't until the 4th century that they really had a canon. And by then the church had already established a canon. <clears throat> and the Apocrypha was in it. And then when we get to the Protestant Reformation, even the Protestants had the Apocrypha in the canon. Go look it up. The Lutherans, the Anglicans, and others as well. But they included that as the part of the canon. And then some of the Protestant denominations that formed, then they said, well, we're going to still include it with our Bibles, but we'll just say that it's beneficial reading, even though we don't believe it's canon. Now, that's an interesting thing, because they said that you should read it. Just understand that we don't treat it as every word in it is divinely inspired by God. And yet, it is beneficial for reading because it is true. The things it says are true. Just that the things it says are not binding by God. But they're true. There may be some things mentioned in it that are binding by God. But the whole work isn't treated as canon. Apologize. So... Then that brings us to the early church fathers, the second generation after the apostles. And when you read their writings and, and you say, well, you know, they're not part of canon, so we can't treat them like scripture. They're not part of scripture. We can't treat them like scripture. That's only said whenever someone proves something with their writings that you don't like. Serious. Oh, then, then the, the issue of, oh, it's not canon, it's not part of the scripture, it's not a scripture, is thrown. But then whenever they find something that they can use for what they believe, they'll, they'll go, well, but, but it's here, but it's here, right after the, the New Testament writings is right here. So let's just, you know, play fair with this and say that, especially with ecclesiology, with our understanding of church, those writings are extremely important. I would say that's the most important function of those writings, is to understand how church was done. So, yeah, and you can learn a lot by reading these. And when you read them, you're going to see that there are a lot of things that feel Catholic. But it's not uniquely Catholic. It's also, it's also uh, those things are also practiced in other ancient churches, like the Eastern churches, the Eastern Orthodox, the um, Oriental Orthodox Church, you know, and, and all of those. One moment. All of those ancient churches have the same <coughs> practices and, and feeling about it to a Protestant. 
very formal, very ceremonial. <clears throat> there are certain, certain practices that they do, that they all do. Sorry about that. So the question is, did they invent that at the time of Constantine and then inherit it? Or was it something that was there from before Constantine? That Constantine just kind of, you know, made more formalized and weaponized it, you know? Well, what we find when we read Ignatius of Antioch, we read Clement of Rome especially, and then we read um, Polycarp, is that a lot of that feeling of Catholic and Orthodox is there in the church already. It's already there. So it's useful to read these writings so you understand what church was to the apostles and the church itself coming out of the apostles and to that next generation. Because you have to understand Polycarp and, and Ignatius were disciples of John. <clears throat> and I said that um, Ignatius knew Polycarp, who was a disciple of John, but actually Ignatius was a disciple of John as well, and John died around 100 AD. Polycarp, uh, Polycarp um, Ignatius died around 107 AD. <clears throat> I know some want to place it about 30 years later, but they're, they're the oddball. Uh, they're the oddball ones. It has always been, and is still the majority what people say is 107, 106, 107 A.D. <clears throat> so, what I'm saying is that it is, it's useful to read these. It's not so hard. I mean, it took me, what, about 50 minutes to read through that to you with commentary. So, if you sat and read through it, it'd take about 20 minutes. You know, maybe even less. And I would definitely use, uh, I would use translation by Lightfoot. He did a lot of work on those, those three. And um, I'm not sure if he translated everything by all of those, but I think so. He was, he was heavily involved in that. Lightfoot was an Anglican priest, so he wasn't Catholic. <clears throat> that way you can be re rest assured you know, that it wasn't translated in order to support Catholic practice or something. And, you know, they changed the, the text of it or something. No, it's, it's a fair translation. But it will help to establish for you that there is authority in the church. And there was then, too. In that generation immediately following the apostles, there was authority in the church. There were positions, and men filled those positions, and you were expected to obey them. You were expected not just to obey them, but you were expected to consult them. As it said in that letter, don't do anything apart from consulting the advice of the bishop. So... And you had the presbytery, which was made up of priests. So, you know, this, this is the reality. Like it or not, as Protestants, you know, it's, it's a little hard to swallow that, right? It's a little hard to say, all right, maybe the church was more Catholic. You know, and what I say is Catholic isn't actually Catholic, it's Christian. And so then you have to come to grips with that. What does that mean for me doing church? What does that mean for, for the group that I belong to and how we do church? Does that mean that we, we've got to change some things then? We've got to submit and we've got to conform and we've got to fit into this model of church that the apostles established and that we see lived out in that next generation. So I hope this helps you to understand the place of these writings. I'm going to include a, a link in the description, and that's to the Rooted Word website, directly to the letters. I've got one letter up there. That's the one that I did the video on. I'm going to put the other translations by Lightfoot up there um, so that you'll be able to just go there to the Rooted Word and go read those translations right there. May the Lord bless you as you seek Him with all your heart.